I'm a 26 year old female and exactly a year ago today I was at a house party in rural Connecticut. A family friend was throwing a college graduation party for their daughter and had invited what felt like her entire graduating class. Their two story house was extremely spacious and felt kind of regal. It had balconies off each bedroom on the second story, two full size kitchens and several dozen acres of mostly wide open property surrounding the house. I was about four months pregnant at the time, and after a couple of hours of socializing, I began to feel drained from mingling with dozens of people I didn't really know. I retreated to one of the bedrooms upstairs to put my feet up. My husband came upstairs with me, and we went into one of the bedrooms facing the backyard. Across the hall were several of the younger kids in another bedroom, playing video games very loudly. As I lay on the bed, my husband sat beside me rubbing one hand on my stomach while he sampled a variety of craft beers he had selected from downstairs. We were shooting the shit, and he was giving me his opinions on the brews, as I couldn't sample them myself. And after about 10 minutes or so, he started massaging my tired feet. I happened to glance over to the table where the TV was, and noticed something that seemed out of place. There was a flathead screwdriver perched awkwardly, practically hanging off the side of the table. The screwdriver by itself wouldn't have been too weird, but the fact that it was extremely rusty and coated with old dirt made me suspicious. It didn't seem like the owners of the house would use that kind of tool, especially in this room, where everything was so pristine. As strange as it was, I didn't want to say anything to my husband, because I didn't want anything to distract him from rubbing my feet. There is nothing sexier than a good foot massage. After I'd say was another 10 minutes, both myself and my husband jumped when someone started lighting off fireworks on the back lawn, and an explosion of noise and red sparks suddenly came from outside the balcony window. The rowdy kids in the next room suddenly got very loud at the noise, and I heard them drop a few expletives. My husband walked over to the door and poked his head out into the hallway, calling out to them to quiet down. That's when I turned my head and saw it. Just outside on the balcony, looking in at me, I saw half of a face peering around the corner, the silhouette of a body outlined against a new explosion of green fireworks. I screamed for my husband as the man outside turned the knob and walked into the bedroom. The best way I can describe the way he looked was how Brandon Lee looked in the movie The Crow. He was tall and thin. His cheekbones and jawline looked like they were practically tearing themselves out from under his skin. He had long greasy black hair and wore torn and ragged black clothing with heavy boots. He grabbed the screwdriver off the table without looking at me and disappeared back onto the balcony. He was in the bedroom for perhaps four seconds, but it was enough time for my husband to turn around and see him. He then shouted, Who the fuck? The man leapt off the second story balcony and my husband dashed outside and called after him as he walked across the backyard and disappeared around the side of the house. There were about 60 people in the backyard, but most of them had their eyes on the fireworks, and the music was so loud they couldn't hear my husband and I screaming. We immediately sprinted downstairs and told the homeowners, but they were half plastered and didn't take what we said very seriously. My husband and I wanted to call the cops, but the owners blew off that notion like we were waiters offering them dessert. My husband returned upstairs and got all the kids to come down, and he told me that while he was up there, he checked the lock on the balcony and reported it had been broken from the outside. We informed the handful of sober people we knew who were still there, and left. To this day, I don't know who that man was. My husband suspects it might have been the eldest daughter's dealer, as it was her room we were chilling in. Frankly, I don't care who it was. He had been out there on that balcony for at least 20 minutes watching me and my husband as we sat peacefully inside. If he had wanted to, he could have easily made to stab either of us with the screwdriver before he leapt out into the night. We haven't gone back to that house since. Growing up, I lived in a small town in a heavily forested area. Around second grade, my best friend, who shall be known as Celia, began complaining to me about very strange things happening in her house. 
The first thing she pointed out to me was a small hole that was forming in the walls of her unfinished basement. The walls were made of a sort of brick cinder block material, but expanding as if the bricks were crumbling. I remember asking Celia if her parents knew about this, and she told me that they weren't worried. Fast forward some odd years later, around 4th or 5th grade, the hole had only become larger over time, and we can now fit a large portion of our arms into the hole. As far as my arm would go, I couldn't feel the end of the hole, and we couldn't explain why it had corroded deeper into the house, but it hadn't gotten much bigger in girth. At this point, Celia also began telling me that she could hear voices from her basement, and that she believed that most of it was coming from the hole. I never heard any of these sounds when I would visit her house, but considering we were only 10 years old when this happened, I totally believed her. We frequently had sleepovers on weekends, which was when I was usually exposed to all the creepy things wrong with her house. Her family was kind of strange, and the fact that they had an abnormal amount of animals... They had six cats and dogs, a few rabbits, birds, lizards, snails, frogs, fish, etc. Around the time when she was hearing the voices, we began to notice her cats and dogs would randomly disappear and would be found later in the basement, standing right in front of the hole. In all the years I've known her and her animals, they had never liked to be in the basement. It started to really scare us and she was telling me that she believed that there was something living in the walls, and that the hole was one of the places it would peer into the house. At this point in time, I did believe her, but I'd never really seen enough proof to be as scared as she was. In school, she spent most of her time in an anxious wreck. The teachers and the other classmates were really worried about her. It really seemed like her parents just didn't care. A lot of the adults believed that she was only anxious because her older sister had left for college. Now here's where we get to the really terrifying part. I was sleeping over at her house during the weekend, over the Christmas holiday. On a side note about Celia's room, is that she has a huge collection of stuffed animals of all sizes, clearly because of her family's love of animals. Anyways, the first night we were sleeping in her bed, and when we woke up the next morning, all the animals were facing and staring right at us. I don't believe now, and I didn't at the time either, that Celia could have moved all those toys. I've always been an extremely light sleeper, and some of the animals were on top of a very large wardrobe. We both knew that whatever Celia believed to be living in the walls had to have been responsible for this. We put back all the animals very carefully, and we never told her parents. I sort of wish we had now, since I was staying the entire weekend. We went again to sleep that night in her bed. We woke up around the same time, and it was still dark out. We both heard a very low creaking noise that was coming from underneath us. We both knew it was the wooden floorboards under her bed, just like in a textbook horror movie, and probably because we were only 10. We thought it was a good idea to lean over the edge of the bed and look under. Right as we looked, we saw and heard one of the floorboards slam back into the ground. We shot our heads back up and held each other and cried. I've never been so scared in my life, and I called my parents the next morning to come take me home right away. I refused to ever go back to Celia's house in fear, and she only got worse at school. I don't remember if I ever continued to ask her about the things in her house. Maybe I didn't because I was just too scared, and we were so young. For unrelated circumstances, my family moved far away from that town that summer, and I had only seen her twice after that and that was over a decade ago. I have never heard from her since, and I've always wondered what happened, as I know her family still lives in that house today. Many have suggested that this might be paranormal. I tried to be very detailed, but I left out my personal thoughts on the matter, because the scariest part is not knowing. My theory is that there was a man, or a group of people living in the walls of her house. The hole was their way of seeing and hearing what was going on in the basement. And if no one was in the basement, they would come out. The stuffed animals had to have been by someone who was disturbed and wanted to mess with us. The next night, the floorboard trick might have been a way to listen if we were sleeping. Since I only saw one floorboard move, there is no way that was how they got into the room. They probably had several surveillance points so they knew when they could move around the house. So this was not a paranormal encounter. In a way, 
this was far worse. Last October, I took a trip from Washington State to Texas with my boyfriend. He had a great uncle who had passed away and left him a few dozen acres of property in his will. We flew down to inspect the land and decide rather to keep it or sell it. The property was pretty much a wide open patch of dirt with a nice view of the hills without much to offer us. So we decided to sell most of it and build a small house on the land that we kept to live in during the winter months and to rent out during the summer. After the house was finished, we flew back down and moved ourselves in for the remainder of the winter. It wasn't anything super lavish, just something simple and small the two of us could enjoy. After about a week of being there, we were sitting on the front porch when a dusty old pickup truck with deer antlers mounted on the top of the cab came rolling up. A middle-aged couple got out and approached us in a friendly manner introducing themselves as former neighbors of my boyfriend's great uncle. The couple seemed pleasant enough, and they even brought a 12-pack of Shiner beer with them. I thought it was kind of presumptuous of them being complete strangers to show up unannounced, but I figured this must be how people down south do things. We didn't know anyone in the area anyway, and figured we might as well try to make friends. They introduced themselves as Reuben and Charlotte Wallace, and said that they had been hunting buddies with Uncle Trevor and told us stories of their camping trips and shooting heads off snakes. They were polite enough people, but their southern boldness and casual way of discussing guns and killing animals for sport was very foreign to me, and I didn't really form any kind of connection with them. My boyfriend seemed to enjoy their company slightly more, and when they invited us over for dinner the following night, he accepted before even consulting me which was irritating. The following night, we arrived at their very old farmhouse, which was much further away from Uncle Trevor's former place than we had expected. We brought some wine and some beer, not knowing what they prefer to have with dinner, and were greeted before we even reached the front door by Charlotte. The house reeked of cigarette smoke and had a kind of musky, unhealthy feeling to it, like the house was rotting from the inside out. Every room seemed to have at least one American flag, one firearm, and one mounted animal head. I wasn't digging it at all, but my boyfriend seemed unperturbed and didn't hesitate in cracking open a beer with Reuben. We were eating in their dining room, seated next to their wide open sliding patio door, which I thought was strange as it let in the bugs. We were eating a very unimaginative meal of beans and what they claimed was venison, but if it was, I don't think it had been preserved properly, or at the very least was undercooked. I had tried venison before, and this didn't taste right. After 20 minutes, the casual conversation died, and instead, a more interesting and meaningful conversation started up. Things began to get kind of awkward and quiet. Reuben began paying more attention to stroking his beard and looking at us, rather than the food. He began to ask us questions about our uncle's old house and personal possessions, and if he had ever mentioned them to us, I began to get a very uneasy feeling in my gut that the Wallaces were digging for information about Uncle Trevor and were slowly starting to drop the friendly southern neighbor act. My boyfriend didn't have very many answers for them, as he rarely spoke to his uncle when he was growing up, but instead of taking the hint, they just kept on pressing us. Charlotte kept staring right at me, watching me eat, as she shoveled food between her gray teeth, hardly even blinking. I decided to excuse myself for a smoke, and wandered outside out to the open patio door. She said I was free to light up at the table, but I was already out the door. I didn't actually smoke, but was just using it as a signal to tip my boyfriend off that I was uncomfortable and wanted to leave. I wandered out around their backyard and walked around behind their shed, thinking I could at least snap some pictures with my phone of the horizon as the sun set. There was a smell coming from the shed that practically made me gag. It reminded me of a forgotten dumpster that had been baking in the sun for years. I took a few pictures and casually started making my way back to the house when I noticed about 15 or 20 pairs of shoes, mostly sneakers and cowboy boots piled in a heap on the far side of the shed. I walked over to get a better look, 
and noticed that they appeared to be several different sizes. Some were so old and dusty, I could barely make out what original color they had been. I got a sinking feeling in my stomach and cautiously pushed open the shed door. Inside were literally piles upon piles of clothes, hats, and backpacks scattered all around the shed, like a nightmarish goodwill drop-off. And dark stains heavily covered the creaky wooden floor. I noticed how the stains formed a pattern, like a trail that led to the door, indicating that multiple subthings had been dragged out of the shed over time. I backed away, suddenly feeling very nauseous, and my heart nearly failed me when Charlotte was suddenly standing behind me. She started to say something along the lines of, Now why'd you go stick in your head in there? That's when I noticed she had a serrated knife in her hand. I've taught self-defense to young women for many years. I put the heel of my hand directly up to her nose and broke it, sending blood spurting into the air. I screamed for my boyfriend, who came running out of the patio door towards me. I kicked the fallen knife across the dirt and cried for him to run. We sprinted to the car and floored it backwards out of the driveway. Reuben appeared on the front porch and fired at least one shot from a rifle at our car, but fortunately missed. And by the time he raised his rifle for a second shot, we had made it to the road and drove like hell out of there. We didn't go home but instead drove right into town to the police station, where I gave my statement. They sent three cars to the house, and we heard an exchange of gunfire over the radio. Reuben was killed at the scene in the shootout, but Charlotte was never found. The police couldn't locate her on the property. An APB was put out for her at local hospitals in case she sought treatment for her nose, but nothing ever came of it. We returned home for the night, and a police cruiser remained parked outside our house until dawn. A few days later, a detective came to our house and determined that Reuben and Charlotte Wallace were fake names the couple had given us, and that they were really two fugitives wanted for several counts of attempted murder in Arizona. Apparently, they made a habit of patrolling the border and shot at any illegals they found trying to cross. From there, it seemed like they brought the bodies back to their property for disposal. It turns out that Uncle Trevor had known about their activities and had been blackmailing them to keep him quiet. I had to excuse myself to go vomit. I didn't know for sure, therefore I didn't say anything to the police, but in my bones I felt like they had served us human meat, but for exactly what reason I had no idea. Some reporters came to interview us, but we refused to comment on anything. My boyfriend and I still spend time between Washington and Texas, though when we stay in Texas, we have two pit bulls sleep on our front porch to alert us if anyone unwelcome is approaching. To the best of my knowledge, they never found Charlotte, and if she's still out there, I just pray that we never meet again. So back sometime in January of 2013, I was up late suffering from insomnia and watching Moonrise Kingdom. I live in Canada, and this particular night, the temperature was holding steady in the single digits. It was probably around 2 or 3 degrees out. And the roads were like sheets of ice. The only thing I had to eat in the house were oyster crackers and ketchup. So I decided to pause the movie, bundle myself up tight, and brave the frigid wasteland outside to go get some snacks from the mini-mart a few miles away. After putting on several layers of clothing, I stepped outside, locked the door to my townhouse, and walked over to my car. It was so cold out, it actually hurt to breathe, and for a moment, I reconsidered going at all, but my hunger overpowered my discomfort, and I chiseled the ice off my windshield and climbed inside my car. I put the key in the ignition and started the car and immediately turned on the heater but not the headlights. As I was waiting for the inside of the car to warm up, I noticed a red Cavalier drive past me down the street and pull into the driveway of the townhouse that was kitty-cornered from my own. Not having much to occupy my time as the car slowly warmed up, I watched as three people exited the Cavalier, and my heart immediately began to race, as I noticed one of the people in the car had his hands tied behind him. The man who had been in the back seat with the bound man immediately hit him with what looked like a tire iron, and the defenseless man collapsed into the snow. The tire iron man kept beating him, striking his legs and back 
and I could see red patches of blood starting to stain the snow around the fallen man. For some context, this was some time after midnight, so there was no traffic or anyone else outside. The only light illuminating the street was coming from about three or four surrounding streetlights. I didn't recognize any of the men, but I faintly heard them shouting at each other, though I couldn't catch their exact words. The man who had been in the driver's seat came around the side of the car and pulled out a handgun from his jacket. I remembered actually shouting, Oh shit! before clamping my hands over my mouth. I was convinced that I was about to witness a murder, and I was terrified. There was no sense of excitement or grim fascination. This wasn't a movie. This was violent, unscripted reality, and I was suddenly feeling very traumatized. I didn't want to be a witness for what was possibly coming next. My car was on and running, but so was theirs, which was probably why they hadn't noticed me. I didn't dare try to sprint back inside, but I also didn't want to try my luck driving down the icy street where they could have easily chased after me if they chose to. The driver bent down and put his gun to the head of the bleeding man. He remained in that position for a while, and I assumed he must have been talking to him. I began to let myself breathe easier, daring to hope they were just going to get back in the car and drive away without killing him. And then I could call him an ambulance. I had my cell phone in my pocket. Now you might be asking if I had a phone, why wasn't I calling the cops? Because this is Canada, and the cops just don't give a shit. I also didn't want to risk making any noise, or giving my position away with the light of my cell phone screen. You may think this was cowardly of me, and maybe it was, but until you've been in this situation, and there's a guy with a gun 50 yards away from you, I say you've got no right to judge. Anyway, this whole time, the guy with the tire iron had just been standing there, no hat, no gloves, in the freezing cold, staring down at the bleeding man, when my car's engine suddenly stuttered. He glanced up and looked right towards me, and I swear I felt my heart stop. For a moment, he just stared in my direction, and I froze like a deer in the headlights, praying that he wouldn't see me. I'm a pretty scrawny guy and wouldn't have had a chance of defending myself against this dude, even without the weapon. Suddenly, he began to make his way across the street towards me. Maybe he noticed the cloud of exhaust coming from my car, or he was just trying to get a better look. Either way, my fight-or-flight mode kicked in, and I wasn't going to wait for him to get closer. I killed the engine, leapt out of my car, without even shutting the door, and sprinted as fast as I could towards my front door, across the icy driveway. I heard the guy yell, Hey! And I was convinced that at any moment I would hear a gunshot, and suddenly I would hit the ground, bleeding out with the light starting to fade. But thank God, that never happened. I reached the front door and frantically stuffed the keys into the lock. As I turned the knob, I heard the tire iron guy curse and hit the ground. I guess he had slipped onto the ice, but I didn't turn to find out. Once inside, I slammed the door, locked it, and immediately barricaded myself in the guest bedroom, which only had one small window facing the backyard. I left all the lights off and just lie on the ground next to the bed, my heart racing, breathing heavily, expecting at any moment to hear pounding from the front door, but it never came. I lay there cowering for what felt like 20 minutes. When I heard footsteps out in the hallway, I clamped my hands over my mouth to muffle my breathing and strained my ears for any sound from outside the bedroom door. I hadn't heard the front door open, but the soft, steady thudding of heavy feet coming down the carpeted hallway was clear. I told myself that as soon as I heard the doorknob jiggle, I was calling the cops on my cell phone and telling them that my house was on fire. That would get them here quick. After a moment, I thought I heard the footsteps in the living room again, and then nothing at all. I was convinced that the intruder was hiding somewhere in my own house, waiting for me to emerge so he could pounce on me. That was the absolute longest night of my life, and I waited wide awake and terrified, convinced that I was going to die. When the sun eventually came up, I finally found the courage to leave the bedroom. I picked up an empty wine bottle to defend myself as I walked down the hall carefully and peeked outside. There were two police cars parked outside my neighbor's yard, and the Cavalier was gone. 
I didn't recall hearing any gunshots. I walked into my kitchen to take a look around and froze when I noticed my back door was unlocked. My heart sank as I noticed one word that had been carved into my wooden table. Quiet. About an hour later, the cops knocked on my front door and informed me that there had been an assault last night. My neighbor was in the hospital and they asked me if I had seen anything. I lied and said I had passed out at midnight watching movies and had just woken up. That might have been a shit thing to do, but I didn't want to have my name be involved. Whoever these men had been, they were unstable and dangerous and knew where I lived. I didn't want to have to be dragged into court to testify against them. The police asked me if I knew my car door was slightly open. I said no, but simply shrugged and stated that I might have forgotten to slam it shut. They seemed to buy that and left, without any further questions. I threw out the table and got a new one, and have since put in a new security system. I'm not necessarily proud of how I acted that night, but I have no regrets either. Had I tried to be a hero, I might have been killed, so call me a coward if you want, but at least I'm alive. I've never made another attempt to go on a late night snack run ever since. I think this story will be improved by some context about the setting and such. So here we go. First, the story took place after I graduated high school and moved away from my family. I moved up to Alaska again. I say again, because I lived there once before and attended college there. Second, and very conveniently, my mother had been renting out our old house instead of selling it. I say conveniently because the long-standing residents had moved away, and therefore, I was awarded the old house. I had to work quite a bit to keep up the payments, but my mother pitched in, thankfully. Third, at the beginning of this story, I should make you aware that I had recently broken up with a girl who had been staying with me in the old house I was renting through my mother and this breakup was unclean and dysfunctional, much like the relationship itself was. And so finally, the story begins. It was winter break, which means I would be spending more time inside than I normally would. It was somewhat lonely in the house, being without a stable girlfriend then. Also, there was no neighbors really to speak of, as the house was in an extremely wooded region a few miles out of town. One late afternoon, soon after I thought the whole breakup predicament had come to a close, I was made quite aware that it wasn't. My cell phone began ringing, and I saw that it was from an unknown number. Cliché, I know, and I decided to pick it up. It was, of course, my ex. She began telling me about how great her new boyfriend is, and how horrible I was and am. The sort of talk you can smell the booze off the caller's breath from miles away. I actually listened until she decided to hand the phone over to her boyfriend, where he was instead sounding oddly threatening, and I decided to hang up in the most polite manner possible with a fuck you, have a nice day. Days later, again with my mind beginning to forget, only this time about the most certainly drunken phone call, I'm lying in the living room couch watching some TV. While lying there, I noticed something quite unsettling, a person standing in the window behind me. You may ask, how did I notice this? The reflection from the TV screen is how. I didn't move an inch. I had no gun. No knife. I had nothing but my wit and my fists. I just lie there, watching the reflection. Eventually, it moved away from the window. That normally wouldn't spook me. But I was taking into account that, one, the house was nowhere near another, so that's a red flag. Two, if someone was just wanting to talk, they would knock. And three, I was almost certain it was that boyfriend of hers. Nothing became of that situation, but similar situations continued. Such as a car pulling into the driveway and no one getting out, then leaving inconspicuously. This was worrisome at the least, but I didn't suspect a true threat. A few days later, I'm lying in bed. It was very late, and I was getting ready to sleep. I get another call from an unknown number. It was her again, but this time she was asking me to come outside because she wanted to give me an apology. At the time, I was thinking, oh, shall we say, fuck off. 
though I still went outside to see what the deal was. I open the door and of course, it's incredibly dark. I say into the phone, I'm outside. Come around back. With this, I began to walk on the snow-covered ground in the darkness with my just-put-on boots. The motion light turns on as I cross the garage and driveway. The snow masking the ground is tinted yellow by the light. I round the corner of the garage and turn my phone to see. There's a road that runs behind my house and connects to the driveway by bending, and I make my way towards the road. The snow crunches beneath my boots as I make my way closer. There's a part in the trees that allows me to walk straight to the road. Otherwise, no one could make their way around the entirety of the driveway. I reach this part. I ask into the phone. Where are you? I'm in the car. I see you. I step onto the road, and I see her parked car a few dozen feet away from me, with the lights dimmed. So what's the deal? I just want to talk. Come here. I approach the car and I make my way around to the passenger side, and I finally see her face. She waves me in, and I oblige. I get in the car and sit down. I look at her and she says, Look, I'm sorry I know I've been a real bitch lately. No, it's okay. I wasn't really good to you and I deserve it. I don't agree, but... She abruptly stops speaking because a pair of car lights shined from behind us. Naturally, I assume it's her boyfriend. And by the look in her face, she did too. The car parks behind us and sure enough, the boyfriend gets out and storms over to my side of the car. He yanks on the door handle and the door swings open. He attempts to grab me but I grab his wrist and get out of the car. What the fuck do you think you're doing with her, huh? We're just talking and I was about to leave. Bullshit. You're trying to fuck her, aren't you? Look, I'm trying to sleep. I'm in no mood to do anything. He gave me this look of utter enragement before swinging at me and of course missing. A little scuffle ensued and all that happened was him swearing and eventually slipping and falling before yelling at us both. I'll fucking kill you. I just stood by her car as he pulled away. She gave me a lift back to the house and I invited her inside and she obliged. It was late in the night and I suggested that she lock her car if she was going to stay the night. We slept upstairs in my bed before I awoke hours later. There was a banging at the back door, and I knew this because the back door was directly below my room. She woke up too and said, Oh my god. I stood up quickly and got to my closet and reached behind the coats that I never wear, and I grabbed my Louisville slugger. She was sitting upright in my bed with her hands covering her eyes. I didn't say anything before walking down the stairs slowly, attempting to be silent. The lights were off and there were no windows on the staircase, and the pounding on the back door had audibly ceased. I held the bat tightly, making sure it didn't bang into the wall to signal my position at the time. I remember how slowly I stepped down, especially on the bottom three steps, which were always the creakiest. Once I reached the final step, I froze and it still gives me chills to this day. The hardwood floors creak around the bottom of the staircase, and there was a creaking that was growing closer and closer. I raised the bat above my head, ready to slam whoever it was right on top of the head. The creaking grew closer until I could hear it from my side, and I planned to swing as soon as it was in front of me. As the staircase opened to the left from the bottom coming up, I listened ever so carefully. Holding my breath, the creaking came to my northeast, and I squeezed my hands tighter than I ever had before around the bat, waiting for it to come just north of me. There was more creaking sounds. This time, they were directly in front of me, and I slammed the bat down hard, and it hit something, and whatever it was crumpled to the floor with a bang and a small flash. I turned on the light, and there he was, the boyfriend. He had shot his gun directly at the floor and left a hole in the hard wood. My ex came down the stairs crying profusely, muttering, I'm so sorry, over and over again. I called the police and four cops pulled into my driveway along with an ambulance in a matter of minutes. I sat at the base of the stairs watching the boyfriend. He was breathing. I could tell from his chest slowly inclining and declining off the floor. 
I grabbed what I thought was a 9mm off the floor and kept it in my hand with the safety turned on. I just shook my head over and over in utter disbelief. I explained the situation to the police as the paramedics rushed in and carried him out on a stretcher. All in all, I didn't get to sleep until late in the afternoon after everything was done and over with. He ended up actually being induced into a coma but eventually recovered and a restraining order had already been filed in advance. My ex and I became good friends after the incident and she never dated that guy again. I never ended up moving out though. I had considered it but nothing like that has happened since. And there you have it. A year ago, I was 28, living in a condo in southern Arizona. I'm a single parent and live with my three children and my dog, a Belgian shepherd named Loki. The neighborhood that we lived in was very quiet and friendly. My children would often play outside with the neighbor kids on a daily basis, and I didn't have to watch them like a hawk. Plus, my neighbor worked in his garage all day and was able to keep an eye on the kids as well. One fall night last year, I was doing my usual chores, vacuuming, cleaning the rooms, and washing the clothes. I wanted to do as much as I could before the kids came back from their grandparents' house the next morning. I had a sliding glass door in my bedroom that I usually left open halfway so that it would be easier for me to go back and forth to the garage where the washing machine was. Loki also loved to have it open, because it was an easy access for him to run back and forth, inside and outside. I went through my sliding glass door and opened the garage, and when I was putting the lid back down, I turned around and saw Loki growling with his eyes fixed on the roof. I looked up to see what he was growling at, but I didn't see anything. Figuring that it was only a stray cat, I started walking back into the house and was about to slide the door shut behind me when I noticed Loki hadn't moved and was still out in the alley. I normally didn't have to call him, he usually just followed me. I called for him, but he didn't so much as look my way. He was sitting still, looking up at the roof, as if he were waiting for something to appear. Then suddenly, he jumped up and started snarling and barking viciously at the roof. At the same time, I heard heavy thumbs moving across my roof over my head. That was frightening enough, but what scared me the most was the way Loki reacted. I had only ever seen him act like that once before, and that was almost when I got robbed when I was stationed back in Washington years earlier. I quickly pulled Loki inside and shut the door, very shaken, pacing back and forth and crying and growling. I texted one of my neighbors and asked if he could please swing by my house. I didn't feel confident in my suspicions enough to call the police. When my neighbor arrived, he physically climbed up on the roof and didn't find anything. We concluded that it was just probably a cat, but I couldn't shake the gut feeling that those thumps across the roof sounded far too heavy to be made by a cat. A few days go by, and I didn't hear anything more, so I almost forgot about it. Then the next morning comes, and before it was fully light out, I was awake and brushing my daughter's hair and getting her ready for school. When I heard loud footsteps across my roof, I got my old military machete from under my bed and ran out back with Loki. There was nothing. I circled around to the front. Nothing. I went inside to reassure my daughter that it was probably a cat. She looked at me with wide, terrified eyes and said, it sounded like someone was running. Later that day when I came home from work, I saw police cars down the street at my neighbor Colleen's house with an ambulance. Colleen was a very sweet, older and fragile lady. I eventually found out that someone had broken into her house while she was napping and Colleen apparently startled the assailant and he had shoved her into the wall and broken her hip. Colleen lay upon the ground in pain, unable to move until her daughter came to check on her. The police officer started questioning the rest of us, asking us if we had seen or heard anything suspicious lately. I immediately told the officers everything about the footsteps on my roof and how Loki had reacted. In response, the police had officers patrol our neighborhood for about a week. I told my daughters what was going on and explained to them that they couldn't play outside as freely as they were used to for a while. Two weeks passed and I was still on guard. It was late one night and I needed to do some laundry, and I decided that I wasn't going to let my nerves prevent me from getting my parental chores done, so I had my glass door open and ready. On the very last load, I was walking towards the garage 
I paused dead on my tracks and didn't move, barely breathing, trying not to make a sound. Then I heard another creak. I slowly looked up and finally realized where it was coming from, directly above me. My heart sank and my blood went cold, and I know the feeling of being watched wasn't just my imagination. Suddenly, Loki was by my side. He snarled and barked viciously while trying to jump up on his hind legs. I dropped my basket and ran back inside. Just as I made to close the door, I screamed for Loki to come. He came running inside and I immediately locked the door. Barely after a moment I did, I saw a shadowy figure jump down from my roof. My oldest daughter came in and I told her to get my phone and take her siblings into her bedroom and call 911. Loki was barking furiously and foaming at the mouth, desperately wanting to get at this motherfucker. I was absolutely terrified and shaking uncontrollably. The figure was still standing there in my backyard, not moving, and I was unable to take my eyes off him. I had been to war and seen terrible things, but when my children were now suddenly in the crossfire, this shit felt different. The strange man literally walked directly up to me, outside through the glass window, and started glaring at me with fire in his eyes, as if I had just rear-ended his car. He was wearing a hooded sweatshirt and held a crowbar in his hand. I remembered my machete was right next to me, by the nightstand, but I didn't want the man to know that I had it yet. If he tried to break in, I wanted to be able to give him the surprise of his life. He jiggled the handle to try to open the door, then hit the door with the crowbar, but it didn't shatter. My kids were yelling hysterically as he started hitting the door harder and harder. Loki was enraged and leaning up against the glass, putting his own weight on it. I realized that this guy had every intention of coming in, so I grabbed my machete and yelled, Come on, motherfucker! The shock in his eyes was a glorious sight. A police officer jumped my fence and started shouting at him. When the guy didn't drop the crowbar, the cop tased him. As the officer put him in cuffs, I went to go get my kids, and when they saw me, they came running and started hugging me tight. The would-be home invader was charged and sent to prison. My kids are still going to therapy. I'm doing whatever I can to help them cope with everything. Loki is still with us, and we love him very much. If I ever see that guy again, I'm not going to hold back. Everyone keeps telling me how lucky I was, and I agree. But I always remind him that that guy was even more lucky he didn't break in through the glass and had to have dealt with me. This is a story my uncle told me before he died. Unfortunately, I'm unable to provide proof of this occurrence. But I don't think he would lie about something like this. I'm going to write this story from his perspective as it was told to me. It was the mid-1980s in Arkansas. My girlfriend at the time dragged me to a wedding. She was close friends with the bride. The wedding took place on a ranch. I have to say it was a pretty nice setup. Surrounded on all sides by thick forest that stretched on for miles. We were literally in the middle of nowhere. It took us three hours just to reach this place from where we lived. But the journey was worth it, even though I didn't know a lot of people there. I still had a great time. I even danced, and I never dance. There was an open bar, so you can imagine that things got pretty wild as the night progressed. After about an hour of reenacting Saturday Night Fever on the dance floor, I sat down because my feet were starting to hurt. Before I go on, let me explain the layout. The ranch and the outdoor dance floor was located in a clearing, and it was surrounded on all sides by trees. There was a tree line about 35 to 40 yards away from where I was, and there was a lot of bright lights around the dance floor. But beyond that, it was completely dark. As I was sitting there rubbing my sore feet, I could see something taking place in the distance just outside the tree line. I couldn't see too clearly because of the lighting. But what I saw sort of amused me. I saw what looked like a dark figure dragging someone into the tree line. Again, it was hard to see, but I thought the person that was being dragged was wearing one of the bright yellow bridesmaid dresses. I chuckled when I saw that. I remembered thinking, huh, 
Looks like someone drank too much. I feel the need to point out that I too was a little intoxicated. Otherwise, I might have said something about someone being dragged away from the party into a dark forest. Maybe I thought the two were going to get freaky in the woods or something. A few hours later, we left the wedding celebrations. But what I found out two days later made my stomach drop. Apparently, one of the bridesmaids went missing after the wedding. I told the police what I remembered seeing that night. The very next day, they found the body of the missing bridesmaid in the woods. She had been dismembered, and her limbs were found scattered throughout the forest. From what I hear, they didn't even recover all of her body parts. The person responsible for this was never found. I felt guilty for many years after, because I can't help but think I could have saved her life if I had said something. She wasn't even 20 years old yet. She had her whole life ahead of her. But she ended up in pieces. Here's some backstory about me. I lived in rural Kentucky my whole life. I'm 52 and currently semi-retired. I used to be a contractor, but suffered a nasty fall that rendered my left hip near useless. I'm on disability, but I do odd jobs in the local town, sell venison from deer I hunt, and help train younger contractors and give them advice. I try to keep myself busy. I have two with my ex-wife who are now in their late 20s, and one with my current wife who's turning eight next month. My wife is Spanish, so my son looks fully Spanish even though he's half Caucasian. Everyone in town knows my name and my family and knows I'm a good, humble family man. I personally help build the house we're currently living in, and it's deep in the woods. The nearest neighbor is about three miles away. Last weekend, my eight-year-old son woke me and my wife at two in the morning. Jake is a sensitive kid, so the slightest bump in the night caused him to panic. We're used to this. But when he said there was a fire outside in the woods, I was struck with alarm. Half awake, I looked outside my bedroom window and noticed that in the distance, the night sky was glowing orange and there was smoke about 500 yards away from our house. My wife started to panic, picking up the phone and attempting to call the local fire department. I took the phone from her shaking hands and set it aside. I knew it wasn't a wildfire because the light and smoke came from a singular area. A wildfire would have spread by now. Since the woods we live near are very dense, this was a controlled fire, which in a way was far worse, and the fire department wouldn't be able to help. I threw on my hunting gear and rushed my wife and son to the basement. I handed her my cell phone and told her to call her brother. Right before I shut the door, I told her to lock it and to not open it up for anyone other than her brother or myself. I retrieved my bolt-action rifle. My intention was not to harm anyone, but rather only to scare them off. But ultimately, I knew that was a decision that they were going to make for me. I deadbolted the front door and left the house. My wife's brother had a key, but wouldn't arrive for at least 20 minutes. I ventured off in the almost complete darkness across my property following the smell of smoke, the tinge of orange light in the sky, and the sound of the ever-increasing sermon being spewed. I get to the tree line that overlooks a clearing, and it's exactly what I expected. Clansmen. About seven of them in a circle with their arms stretched out, while a smooth-talking preacher is spewing hate while using Christ as a justification. The preacher is standing in front of a makeshift cross as it continues to burn. I've had run-ins with the clansmen before. Due to my property's relative seclusion, they tend to hold sermons in the woods surrounding my house. It only happens maybe twice a year, if not less. I usually fire a round off into the sky to tell them to back the fuck off, and they scatter. The preacher pauses for his followers to say amen and white power. That's when I shoot off around into the sky, and all of them jump about four feet off the ground as I move towards the fire. You must be new. This is my property, and I don't appreciate these activities going on near my family. I loaded another bullet into the chamber and positioned my rifle near my right hip, not taking aim or showing hostility. While the other followers slowly stepped back, their preacher steps forward, coming within 30 yards of me. This is your property? He said with a thick Kentucky accent. Ma, I apologize. 
We scouted the area during the day and didn't see a single house around here. Do you mind telling us where you live? Just so we can meet further away from you and your family. I don't answer. This preacher's silver tongue may have been able to work on his flock of sheep, but it wasn't going to work on me. There was a tense silence between us before one of his sheep spoke up. I know this guy. He's married to a fucking spick. He even has a half-breed with her. The other sheep began grumbling amongst themselves and moved closer towards me. I made a quick jerk with my rifle, raising it up below my shoulder to force them to back away. The preacher chuckled to himself before speaking. <laughs> so that's why you don't want to tell us where you live. You think we're going to break in and harm your family. Good sir, we may hate your wife and child, but we ain't no savages. You may not be, but I don't trust your friends. I said bluntly. I kept my rifle high, not aiming it at anyone directly, but positioning it at the ready in case I had to. You can't choose who you love after all, the preacher said. I bet he was sporting a shit-eating grin under his hood while saying that. You have my word that we will never lay a hand on you and your family. Perhaps we can arrange a deal. My stomach dropped and my trigger hand trembled slightly. A vague threat was still a threat. You don't bring this up with law enforcement or anyone else, and we'll relocate our get-togethers further away from your family. How I see it, you don't have much of a choice. You already fired one shot. Do you think you can take all eight of us out with a bolt action? My friend, that simply is impossible. I remained silent. I took a moment to breathe so I can make my voice remain strong and firm, even though my legs were beginning to shake and my palms were incredibly sweaty. Another 700 yards further into the woods, there's another clearing. If you hold your meetings there from now on, I won't acknowledge what you do, but if you ever come near me again, I'll bring more than a bolt action with me. Understand? My friend, you have yourself a deal. He offered his hand out to shake, but I stared him down right past the slits in his hood, rifle still raised below my shoulder. I didn't accept his hand. Very well. We will be on our way to check out this promising area. You can head on home now. Just be sure to tuck Jake in tight. This must have been just a dreadful experience for the poor boy. I stood dead still in total shock. My vision begins to blur as the preacher and his flock of sheep moved towards the location I pointed them to. Part of me wasn't surprised. Since I worked in the community my entire life, the other part of me was in panic mode. If he knew my son, he knew where I lived. I often held local events at my home. This gathering was not a coincidence. It was a warning. A threat. I got a hold of myself and moved slowly back into the tree line. Watching as their white robes faded into the darkness of the night, I hobbled as quickly as I could back to my home, looking over my shoulder whenever I heard a twig snap or the wind rustle the trees. When I finally made it back, I breathed a sigh of relief and let my wife's brother know what happened. I didn't tell my wife. If she knew, she would have never gotten a good night's sleep in that house again. My wife's brother slept in the guest bedroom in the basement. We took turns keeping guard during the night, and there wasn't a single sign of their return. But I'm still on high alert, even during the day, and especially when I go into town. So far, they have apparently kept their word. Right now, as I write this, I see the sky turning orange and the smoke starting to rise in the distance. It's far enough away to indicate that they're using the clearing I recommended. I just wish they weren't there to begin with. This story is told from the perspective of a female. At the time of this incident, I was 18 and a very not intimidating 5 foot 2, slightly stocky but maybe 130 pounds at the most. I was staying at a friend's house which is off a back road way out in the country of Mississippi. Her street was full of other family members and once you got to the main road, it was an unlit, treacherous, curvy road. 
that went through the woods and was covered on both sides by ditches. It would be suicide if you chose to drive drunk, especially at night. Now on to one of the creepiest moments of my life. I left her house around 1.30 in the morning, slightly buzzed, but was still coordinated enough to drive home. I turned my music up, lit up my high beams, and made the turn onto the main road. Less than two minutes away from my friend's house, out of nowhere, a lady suddenly appears in my headlights. I slammed on the brakes and pulled across the road, into the oncoming lane, and stopped. On the alert for a possible trap, I rolled down the passenger side window and asked if she was alright. She was probably in her late 20s, very disheveled and moving like she was walking across thin ice. After a moment, she replied in a raspy, slightly unhinged voice. I'm very angry with my husband. I stepped out in front of your car to kill myself. No hesitation. Just admitted that to me like she was offering coffee. Are you fucking serious? I shouted at her. She asked me for a light, even though she didn't seem to have any cigarettes, and shambled quickly over to my car. I rolled up my window as soon as she made to reach inside. I could already smell the liquor on her. She very nearly got her fingers caught on my window as soon as I started to roll forward. Then she started screaming at me and rambling on about how she hated her husband and wanted to die. I carefully drifted forward, watching her following me in my rearview mirror as I pulled my phone from my purse and attempted to dial 911. She started banging on my trunk with both hands and I took my feet off the brake and gave it a little more gas just to put some distance between me and her. As the operator came online, by the light of my headlights, I noticed up the road that a red truck had crashed into a ditch. It had to have been recently as the hood of the truck was smoking. The operator raised her voice and I realized she was repeating herself. I apologized to the woman and told her the name of the road I was on and the situation with the truck and the drunk suicidal woman still following me. Suddenly from the driver's side window, there came a loud thump and the light of a cell phone started blinding me. I turned left to see a grizzled man right in my face, shining his phone's flashlight directly in my eyes and screaming for me to stop and open the fucking door. His face was covered in blood. I screamed so loudly that every 911 operator in the building probably heard me. I dropped my phone and floored it, leaving both the man and the woman behind. A bloody handprint standing my driver's side window. After a minute of driving close to 80 miles an hour, I slowed down and told the operator what happened. I hung up when she asked me my name, mostly because I was freaked out. I drove straight home and never called back. To this day, I don't know what their situation was or what became of them. I just know that I'm never driving down an isolated road at night in Mississippi again. I grew up in southern Mississippi, and like most Mississippi kids, my parents were super young when they had me. My mom was a major alcoholic for most of her life, and it was pretty bad back then. My dad worked all the time, which meant my younger sister and I got to spend all of our time with her. Sometimes when she needed a break from us or just wanted to go on another bender, she would leave us with my great aunt, who was 98 years old at the time and very senile. Her property also borders the state mental hospital. My grandmother used to tell us stories about being at my great aunt's house when random people would wander up to the house asking to use the phone. Sometimes they would still be wearing hospital gowns. I was eight years old when this specific incident happened. My mom dropped us off sometime in the afternoon on Friday. My sister, who was five, went straight to the living room to play with toy horses next to my great aunt who was wrapped up in knitting a blanket on her recliner while watching TV. A timer in the kitchen went off and she asked me to take some biscuits out of the oven. As I walked past a window that overlooked a large old willow tree in the front yard, I thought I saw the figure of a man under the branches. I couldn't tell if it was a trick of the shadows, so I called over for my great aunt to come check it out. When she got to the window, she pushed her glasses up to the bridge of her nose. I pointed to the tree and said, I think I see someone out there. She squinted her eyes and studied the tree for a moment 
before throwing up her hands laughing. I was so confused. She looked down at her old leather watch and whispered to herself, Oh, silly me. It's that time. She began to shuffle out of the room saying, The bicycle man is hungry. I followed her into the back room. She then turned on a lamp that was next to an old torn black leather couch where a pillow and blanket were laid out. Not only that, there were two half-empty glasses of water on the table. She picked the pillow up and fluffed it, then began straightening the blanket. As she did this, she began to tell me how, The bicycle man visits me every night. We have some dinner and coffee. Then I put him to bed. He then rides off in the mornings. At this point, eight-year-old me was completely creeped out and I began to feel my body tremble. I moved quietly back into the living room, crawling on my hands and knees, trying not to be seen from outside the window. I locked myself in a spare bedroom with my sister and pulled the house phone in with me. I desperately tried calling my mom, but unsurprisingly, she didn't pick up. I didn't know my dad's work number, and this was before he had a cell phone. We heard the man enter the house. He had a very deep voice and was coughing a lot. I don't remember exactly what he and my great aunt were talking about, but he used a lot of profanities and barked with laughter after she asked him a question. I distinctly remember him using the words, bloodstains, but he kind of said it slowly, almost like he was singing it. My sister and I didn't come out for supper. We stayed there until it got dark out, and I made my sister share the bed with me as I lay awake, as still as I could slowing my breathing so that I could hear whatever noise he might be making in any corner of the house. I don't know exactly what time it was, but I remember my heart skipping a beat when I heard heavy footsteps walking down the hall. They made their way to just outside our door, then the doorknob started turning. I knew my aunt had a key to the room, and I remember praying that the strange man didn't know where to find it. After a moment of wrestling with a locked door, the man let out a mournful, almost disappointed cry, like the sound a kid would make after he dropped his ice cream cone. The footsteps walked back down the hall, and I stared at the door in terror, my heart pounding in my ears. I don't remember falling asleep. I just remember the sound of my mom moving around in the kitchen the next morning. As soon as I realized what time it was, I hauled ass into the kitchen and explained what happened. My mom looked really concerned, so she asked my great aunt about it, to which she gave her the same story that she had given me the night before. I told my mom about the makeshift bed in the back room too. We went to take a look at the couch. Another half-empty glass of water was on the nightstand, and the bedspread was messy, as if someone had slept there and left in a hurry. My mother flipped her shit, then called her friend at the sheriff's office about the stranger on the bicycle. A few days later, my mom got a call from her friend. They had picked up a guy on a bicycle who was trying to break into a house nearby. They found a knife, some rope, and several bags of biscuits on him. Apparently, he had been responsible for several break-ins in the area while he had been staying with my aunt. I tried to find some newspaper articles or anything online about the bicycle man, but I had no luck. My great-aunt died a couple of years later. As for the bicycle man, I don't remember his name or what became of him. I barely remember what he looked like, but he gave me the worst night of my life. I'm a female and at the time I was approximately 18, 19 years old. My youngest brother was in 8th grade and was due to be confirmed at the end of the year. For those of you who are unaware of what that is, it's a ceremony performed in Catholic elementary schools that sort of confirms your faith and dedication to the religion before sending you off to high school. For this ceremony, the person being confirmed has to have a sponsor that is 18 years of age or older and also has to be Catholic themselves. Thus, my brother chose me. Personally, I had moved on from Catholicism as I did not agree with a lot of what I had learned, but I accepted my brother's request as it was very important to him. Fast forward to the day in which my brother was being confirmed. As a sponsor, my role is significant but short-lived. From what I can recall, we simply placed our hands on our sponsor's shoulders 
While they made their promise to God and the religion itself, and promised to support them on their journey. I may be missing a few details, but that's the basic gist of it. Thus, after our portion is complete, they request that we leave the stage and join the crowd, to watch the remainder of the ceremony. Due to the fact that the church was quite packed, my family was standing along the back wall, so I walked off the stage and through the crowd to join them. There was not much left in the ceremony at this point, so it ended quite quickly. The students and priests began leaving the stage. They had to venture around the crowd, thus walked along the walls as opposed to going through the middle. That day I was wearing a blush-colored high-neck blouse, a black knee-length skirt, and gray nylons that had a black velvet rose pattern on it. As I mentioned, my family were up against the back wall of the church, preparing to move ourselves out of the way to make room for the students and priests that were making their way towards us. We congratulated them all as they passed, and began saying our hellos to the priests as they made their way towards us. However, the very last priest in the line, who looked to be about 80 years old, stopped dead in his tracks while in front of where I was standing. The priest then proceeded to slowly look me up and down, twice, with a very unnerving smile on his face. Following this, he leaned in and whispered the words, I like your pantyhose. I was immediately set on edge. I moved in closer to my family as he continued to follow the line. After a few minutes, my mom turned to me and asked me if I was okay, as she saw the expression on my face. I advised her as to what just happened, and she was completely disgusted. My mother thought about saying something, but I advised her not to do so, as I didn't want to ruin my brother's day. She reluctantly agreed. As soon as we were able, we made our way out of the church and decided at that moment that we were never going back. I'm an uninteresting man in my late 20s with a stable job and a happy family. I never once entertained the notion that I might one day be the target of a stalker. So here's my story as a warning to everyone. You don't have to be a typical pretty young lady to catch the eye of a stalker. I don't know if this makes sense, but I am a habitual yet very casual Facebook user. I don't post a lot, but I do check my newsfeed often. One Saturday night, I was doing a quick round on Facebook before I went to bed when I received a friend request. I accepted it without hesitation. Just about every friend request I receive gets accepted because I don't ever post anything very personal. As I said, I have a very casual approach to social networking. I do a quick glance on the profile that had friended me and saw that it was obviously a fake account. Not thinking much about it, I put my computer away and fell asleep. The next day I was having lunch at a friend's house, having completely forgotten about the friend request from the night before. My phone buzzed and I saw I had gotten a message from a coworker of mine, Maya. Although Maya and I worked together and had a few mutual friends outside of work, we didn't communicate much other than when it was about work. I checked it, assuming it was work-related, and I guess, looking back, you can say it was. To get the gist of it, the Facebook account that friended me also friended Maya, and had bombarded her with insults and accusations of being a whore, and a slut, and every other name in the book. The person took it a step further by messaging Maya's husband, saying that she was cheating on him with a co-worker. Maya wanted to know if I knew who the person was. I explained to her how I accepted every friend request and had no idea who it was. I then proceeded to unfriend the profile in question. Maya explained to me that she already had suspicions on who it was and just wanted to see if I could confirm it. Let's rewind back a few weeks earlier. I had received a friend request from Carrie. It struck me as odd because although we worked at the same place, we never actually met, never spoken, or even made eye contact within 20 feet of each other. We worked in different departments, but I had to walk through her department to get to our lounge. That was the furthest extent of our interactions. I only learned her name when she friended me on Facebook and I recognized her picture. I'm not sure how she found out my name. Carrie also friended my wife's profile and subsequently started sifting through my wife's posts and photos, liking and commenting on several of them. She began interacting with my posts as well, as though we were good friends. 
At work though, I would still walk by as usual and still no interaction. I found it odd, but I didn't think much of it. The mysterious Facebook account continued to harass Maya until she told the person that she knew it was Carrie and was going to call the police. I thought that was the end of that, but I was very wrong. Over several weeks, I began getting more friend requests from girls looking to hook up with me. Obviously, I knew they were all fake, and for the most part, I ignored them. I also began getting notifications from my Google and Facebook accounts about suspicious activity on my profile. Most of the time, it warned me of failed login attempts. One I specifically remember said my Facebook account was actually logged in from somewhere unusual and asked me whether or not it was me. It wasn't me, and I should have been more concerned, but for some reason I didn't care, which was stupid, and even after that I didn't bother to change my password. At the time I viewed all these activities as random, isolated incidents. I had no valuable information on my account, and didn't have any private secretive messages. So what harm could a potential hacker do? A few months pass when one day, my wife gets a message from Carrie stating that she had a high-end video camera and was looking to start some amateur filming. She wanted to know if we would help her by letting her film our family for a day. Remembering what Maya had said months ago, I was reluctant but wanted to give Carrie the benefit of the doubt, so we agreed to tell her that we would schedule a time for whenever we weren't busy and left it at that. Once again, I have yet to actually meet Carrie. More weeks pass by and we completely forget about scheduling the film shoot with Carrie when she messages me about it. I apologize about forgetting about it and turned her down when she asked to reschedule, suddenly feeling very uneasy about the whole thing. Then things got weird. She sent several gifts of stick figures doing sexually suggestive motions. I didn't respond, so she asked, Funny, isn't it? I immediately texted my wife to log into my Facebook profile to observe the messages. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed with Carrie as of the humor of the gifts and carried on the conversation. She proceeded to send me old photos from my abandoned MySpace account that I had completely forgotten about. It was around this time when MySpace had been revamped and people lost a lot of cherished memories. Somehow she dug mine up and decided to share them with me. Things escalated quickly from there. She began talking about her body and how she wasn't attractive, trying to bait me into complimenting her looks. She wasn't beautiful at all in the traditional sense, but she wasn't exactly hard to look at. I wasn't falling for it though. Then she hit me with something out of the blue. She asked me about my cock and suggesting that it was probably really big. I decided that that was enough and stopped responding. Of course my wife was reading the whole time and we were texting back and forth about how funny and weird this all was. I continued to go to work and still awkwardly never actually met her. I especially didn't want to strike up any conversations after that. Carrie messaged me one final time asking me for a favor. Maya had blocked her profile and Carrie suspected that Maya was saying bad stuff about her. So she wanted me to check her profile to confirm. I told her that I wasn't going to spy on Maya for her, and that was that. Just between us though, I did check, and no, Maya couldn't care less to waste her time talking about Carrie. Around this time, my wife got a text from an unknown number. The person knew her name, and was trying to remain anonymous, and was also trying to flirt with her. We were with a bunch of friends at the time, and we all thought it would be funny if we all text flirted with this person. Once again, I never thought to connect any of these occurrences. Carrie eventually quit work and I continued to get suspicious activity that I stupidly continued to write off. I had pretty much forgotten all about Carrie. Then I would say over a year later, my wife drops a bomb on me. A good friend of ours started texting my wife, saying that I was sending very inappropriate messages on Facebook. I had been busy running errands all day and hadn't really checked my Facebook at the time. I found that my password had been changed and when I finally logged back on, all my messages had been cleared. I had no idea the extent of what happened until I started hearing from more people that I was being very suggestive and nasty to them. The thing was, these were not random women on my friends list that were targeted. These were women that were close to me, good friends, 
my wife's sisters, and my friend's wives. These messages weren't holding back either. They went all out in graphic detail about what I wanted to do to them. I felt completely violated and humiliated. I couldn't imagine how the women felt. My wife and I were really close to our families and friends. And every other week or so, all of our friends would get together and drink, barbecue, watch movies or sports, and hang out. We've had several families over and never had a problem. All of them said they understood what happened and that they knew it wasn't me. Deep inside though, I could see that they felt that it probably, potentially, possibly was me. Over time, more and more of them stopped coming over to the point where my home started to feel empty. I confided in my wife about how I felt that they thought it was me and she rebutted that I was being paranoid. She argued that our friends were just busy with their lives and they would eventually come over again. I learned that someone had created a Facebook account using my name and picture and continued harassing the same women. Some of them posted a picture of the conversations with me on Facebook. She commented that it really could be me because that mystery person talked just like me, using the same vocabulary. She also stated that the person knew my friends and family extensively. My heart instantly shattered after reading that. I quit checking my Facebook for the longest time, and I guess I fell into a mild depression. I felt miserable. I told my wife that I wanted to disappear, and strongly considered quitting my job of seven years and moving away to start over. I know now that I was being quite irrational, and thankfully my wife stayed strong for me through it all. I felt I needed to defend my honor and started gathering alibis of times, people, and places I was around during the time of many of those messages. My wife brutally told me that she couldn't believe I was weak enough to let a no-life dumbass on Facebook put me down and make me feel that way, which was true. I am and always have been a mentally strong person. I always look for the best in a bad situation, but for some reason this affected me differently. I can't explain why but I felt extreme shame and guilt for something I didn't even do. Without my wife's support knocking me back to reality, I don't know what would have happened. We advised our friends to just ignore the person and eventually everything stopped. From time to time I still get random friend requests, but I don't accept them anymore. I don't have any proof that this was all the work of Carrie. It just all happened during a time when she injected herself into my life. My friends have started coming over again but it hasn't felt the same ever since. I don't know if it's them or just in my head. My wife and I came to the conclusion that Carrie reveled in the misery of others. After tormenting Maya, she moved on and targeted me, trying to ruin my marriage and distance me from my friends. And she did this for no reason other than the fact that she enjoyed doing it. I'm pretty sure she hasn't stopped and left me alone only because she found a new victim to harass. When I was 15 years old, I started a live journal account. At the time, a lot of my friends were also using the platform. It was basically early social networking, where people with similar interests would come together and read each other's blogs. I had only been posting for a short while when a guy began to comment on my entries. He said his name was John. It really should have made me more suspicious that there was a grown man trying to reach out to me through the internet. He claimed that he knew my friend Dale who was two years older than me. We attended the same high school. I contacted Dale and asked him about John, to which he replied, Oh yeah, John's awesome. We met on LiveJournal. He talked the guy up like he was super cool and I should totally interact with him. John continued to leave comments on my journal frequently, but in addition to that, he began to email me. One of the first things he sent me was a screenshot of his computer desktop where he had assembled a collage of pictures of me he had copied from my live journal account, which made me super uncomfortable. I told Dale about it, but he just laughed it off, saying that John was just fucking with me. I decided to let it slide because I trusted Dale. After about a year of awkward emails from John, a woman named Jillian contacted me who claimed to be John's sister. There was some fucked up convoluted story about how they weren't actually siblings, but they were raised together. I can't really remember all the details, but she began to send me extremely vicious messages, 
followed up almost immediately after by apology messages where she would talk to me like I was a puppy, saying cutesy shit like how darling and precious I was. After about a week, I began to suspect that Jillian didn't exist and was created by John to further harass me or something to make himself look better. Shortly after that, John began sending me interracial porn and made extremely racist comments about them. That was enough for me, and I blocked both him and Jillian. In retrospect, it was right about then that I should have filed a police report. John eventually found a way to contact me with another email address. I'm not sure how. Maybe Dale told him. He tried to apologize for his behavior, but I just ignored him. I had had enough of this craziness. Around this time, Dale moved to another city with two of our mutual friends, one of whom I've kept contact with. He warned me that Dale and John started talking a lot on the phone, and he suspected that John was supplying Dale with pot because Dale had started smoking constantly. The idea that Dale and John were becoming so close made me very uneasy because Dale knew my home address, phone number, and all kinds of other personal information. Shortly after, my discomfort was validated when I received an email from John stating that he was visiting my hometown soon and intended to swing by. I emailed him back and told him that if he ever contacted me again, that I would go straight to the police and press charges against him for harassment, as I had saved every email I ever got from him or Jillian. Shortly after, I received a call from Dale's roommate, who told me that Dale had received a call from John, who was enraged after I had sent him that email. I decided that I had to cut Dale out of my life as well. He had become untrustworthy and was letting his own life fall apart. All he ever did was smoke pot and play video games, mooching off his roommates and other friends for money and food. After a few months, his roommates kicked him out after an incident occurred at their apartment where someone had tried to break down the door looking for Dale, who owed him money. Apparently having nowhere else to go, Dale moved in with John, who turned out to be a 50-something-year-old trucker who didn't have a sister named Jillian. And it turned out that John wasn't even his real name. As far as I know, they're still living together. To this day, I still have no idea what motivated John to keep contacting me. I just know I dodged a bullet. Had I been more receptive or less cautious, he may have drawn me into his web of drugs and lies and ruined my future. Sometimes I do feel bad for Dale, but honestly it's his own dumbass fault. But I do hope that he someday turns his life around. I know John and I never officially met, but as far as online communications go, I hope I never encounter this deranged man again. There's always a reason to be afraid.